topic for this teaching is the divorce conundrum. Conundrum, of course, means a difficult question. So we're going to look at this because there's been, frankly, a lot of erroneous teaching for either in Christianity, sometimes in Hebrew roots. For one thing, recently in my area, there was a teacher going around saying, you must divorce your spouse if they're not absolutely following Torah. And uh, he drew away some people after him and almost messed up some marriages. This is contrary to Scripture, and we're going to look at that. There's also other things in Scripture regarding the subject of divorce that people want to make it, at least in certain segments of Christianity and maybe Hebraic and uh, Messianic circles, the unpardonable sin. And it's not that either. So we're going to look at this from a scriptural perspective. I realize that I'm going to probably leave out some stuff I should have touched on. But I've been told to keep this video as close to an hour as possible. So we're going to look at that from the time limits I've been given. Thank you all very much. And again, shalom to your home. And let's get started. We're going to go to Shemot, or Exodus, chapter 4, starting in verse 19. Now, I'll primarily be using the ISR version. If you have the Hallelujah Scriptures or some other version, please follow along. And I understand this is specifically for men, but if there's some ladies and wives out there viewing, I hope you can get some benefit out of this as well. And we read that Yehovah said to Moshe in Midian, Go return to Mitzrayim, for all the men who are dead that sought your life, they're gone. So he gets ready to set out. On this journey, he's going to take his wife, Zephora, and his sons with him. He gets the blessing of his father, Yethro, as he's returning back to Mitzrayim. He's been given the rod of Elohim in his hand. He's been given the call. And this is where we're going to pick up the story. And as we read through this, we see that Pharaoh's going to refuse to let them go. Now, there's an unusual thing that's going to happen in this passage, and we're getting ready to see it right here. He sets out on his journey, and he stops at the uh, Holiday Inn Express of his day. It says he stops at the end. People don't realize that you had inns 4,000 years ago for travelers along the trade routes where you can water your camel. And, you know, who knows? Did they have a video game room? I don't think so. But he stops at the end with his family, and an unusual event occurs. Let's read what it says. And it came to be on the way in the lodging place that Yehovah met him and sought to kill him. Wait a minute. What's going on here, folks? you got to read this carefully. He just got called by Yah, and now Yah's going to kill him? What happened? Why didn't he say something back in Midian? What's going on here? Let's see if we can follow this, and we're going to draw a conclusion. This is not the end, though. Regarding something Moses has a problem with that causes a problem in his marriage. And Zephora, Zephora, if I can talk right, took a sharp stone good to nap flint. If you don't have that skill, you know, get with your local Cherokee guy or, you know, Israelite that knows how to nap flint. You might need a good uh, napped knife sometime. But anyhow, she took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and threw it at his feet and said, you are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him go. Who let him go? Y'all let Moshe go. Then she said, you are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Now, I'm going to tell you something most of y'all read over and you don't know. There's two guys in Scripture that have a problem with circumcision. And guess what? It's not Paul. It's Moshe and it's Peter. Though this teaching is not about circumcision, here we have the first example 
that Moses, who's been circumcised by his parents, never circumcised his sons. Now, this is a command that precedes the Torah handed down from Sinai. This is the instruction given to Father Abraham. As there were instructions from Adam about the Shabbat and not eating blood, all of these commands precede the instructions given to Yehovah through Moses to Israel. Why didn't Moses do what Abraham taught? He hadn't circumcised them. Here's the thing. These men, boys, I say men, and that's correct. These boys are not eight days old. They're not babies. They're not even 13 years old as the Ishmaelites were used to doing of circumcising their sons because of Ishmael being circumcised when he was 13. So what? <clears throat> we've got a problem here. It causes a problem in the relationship. And we're going to see there's some results of that. So what are we going to do here? If Yah says do something in the Torah, you can either choose to do it or not do it. What is he saying in another place in the Torah? Obedience is better than sacrifice. We can talk Torah all day long, or we can practice Torah to the best of our ability by faith and love. Because what did Yahushua say? If you don't believe that Yahushua the Messiah, or Yeshua as some of you like to call him, wrote the Torah by inspiration via the Spirit, we're going to have to have another video on that and a longer conversation. But Yah pinned this via the Spirit. Here's Moses. He hadn't done something, and now his wife is in a very embarrassing situation. These are grown men. They're over 13. They're not doing a bar mitzvah. These, these guys are probably closer to 20. We can speculate about the age, but why put your wife in that situation? What's my point here about relationships, guys? Don't, because of your disobedience, put your wife in a difficult situation. Now, you can say, well, my wife's not following Torah. Don't worry, we're going to get to that in this message. But don't put your wife in a difficult situation by your disobedience to Yah's word or because of some boneheaded dumb thing you do. It's going to cause you problems in the relationship. you got to have a little wisdom. You're not the big grunting gorilla that gets whatever he wants. Submit to me. Well, why don't you submit to Yah? So we had a problem here, and we're going to see the results of this, and it causes a problem in Moses' marriage. Now we're going to hit the second part of this, and we'll probably have a couple more parts. We're going to go to Shemot, or Exodus, chapter 18. Y'all can follow along specifically verses 1 through 7. Now, this is about a two-year period from the time Moses leaves Egypt. They're at the Sinai, so we don't know if this is a year into it, a year and two months, whatever, but there's going to be two years from the time they leave Egypt till the Mishkan's finished. So these events take place during that time. Now, I'm going to read you this, and we're going to look at something that uh, is unusual. And Yethro, the priest of Midian, and boy, I'd like to talk more about that. There's so much false teaching that he's a pagan priest. A pagan priest. If, let me talk right here again. Uh, but he's not. We'll cover that in another video. Gosh, so many good topics. Moses' father-in-law heard it all that Elohim had done for Moshe and Israel, his people, and that Yahweh had brought Israel out of Mitzrayim. And Yethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, pay attention to this, the wife of Moshe, after he had sent her back. Now, who sent her back? Moses sends her back. They get in this awful fight because of what happens in chapter 4. And Moses says, fine, you can't go down here. I'm sending you back. Now, certain translations will have that. If you read some of the comments and you look at the Hebrew, and uh, they'll have it, he divorced her because it's a forceful sending away. 
shalach. We, it means to send away uh, or to send someone. Uh, many times the Greek word for evangelist in the Hebraic community gets translated as shalach or sent one. But Moses sends her back to daddy. And many commentators will read that word because it's and, and say, well, this is a divorce because she was forcefully sent back. Now, sending your wife away, we're going to see later on, is not a divorce. You can be separated. She's sent away, but that's not a divorce. This is going to become important when we read another scripture on this divorce subject. Now, was Moses right to send her away? That's great Moses, the great teacher, you say. He, he's right. No, he wasn't. Many men, again, don't send your wife away. Well, she's this, she's that. Well, that's why you need the brothers to pray with you, to pray for you, to counsel you. But you don't just send her away because you've had a fight. Now, if she leaves and she shouldn't, then the problem's with her. But you don't, oh, this woman won't follow Torah, remember? I give you the reference of the guy that came to our area, not going to mention names, and he went to some fellowships teaching that, well, if your spouse, husband or wife, is not absolutely following Torah, you got to send them away. you got to divorce them. No, you don't. This is contrary to Scripture. Moses sends her away. Back to Daddy. Guess what? Daddy is a smart man. He brings her back to Moses. And I'm sure when based on the when we look at the context, there's some important things he says. One in the context of chapter 18, there's another point, and that's about judges. See, Moses up to this time had been doing everything. He'd been directing everything. He'd been hearing all the legal cases. He's like some teachers out there in the Hebrew Roots movement. He's the great poobah, and he can't take correction from anybody. That's a problem. One of the problems in the Hebraic Roots, and I'll say it to leaders, and I'll say it to men, is your failure to to submit to each other. You want your wife to submit, why don't you submit to each other? That's why we have judges, sofa team, or other elders set up in the assemblies. One of the most embarrassing things in the Hebraic and Messianic roots is they have no bet den. A friend of mine who's ex talked extensively to Orthodox rabbis, and they get into conversations about the Messianics and Yeshua and all this, and uh, a couple of rabbis told this friend of mine, he said, we got one problem with y'all is y'all have no bet dens. No one comes under authority. Every man does what's right in his own eyes. And that's where a lot of the Hebraic roots is at today. We're in the period of the judges, but no one's listening because no one has judges. So this is another thing. You need to set up elders in your congregation, and they don't need to be rubber stamps for the great Rebbe. I'm going to get on a high horse about the Rebbe stuff, so I need to probably shut up there. But there needs to be accountability amongst men. So Moses brings his wife back. I'm sure he helps a reconciliation there and gets things fixed up because Jethro seems like a wise man. And so the elders, Moses understands from Jethro, set up some elders. Don't try to do it all on your own. Don't try to be the great Rebbe, the great teacher, the great I can do everything. I remember one time when I was in the Christian church, a pastor told me, well, you've got to be the janitor, the song leader. You've got to do all this, or, or you, you're not effective in ministry. That's absolutely crazy. You'll burn yourself out. I'm not a song leader. I'm not even, per se, a shepherd, even though I hold the title of Roi. Why? Because I have difficulty cleaning up sheep dung. I'm more of a more a teacher. However, I do serve on a bet den with several other elders and roes. We have a presbytery style government, if you want me to use church language. It's not the great Rebbe leading the congregation and a bunch of men rubber stamping what he does. So here's another thing. Accountability 
in leadership and accountability amongst the men. Another important point on the divorce issue. So I hope you've taken away a little bit. We're going to pick up now with some other scriptures we've talked about to be sent away. Shalak. And uh, doesn't constitute a divorce. It constitutes a separation. And we'll look more later about that. But let's go now to Deborim in the Torah, because this is going to get used by a lot of Christians, and they're going to probably quote from Matthew to make a point about divorce. Another thing we're going to see is a uh, misunderstanding of divorce and adultery from a biblical perspective. Uh, you got to look at some history, culture, in Second Temple times, but you also got to look at Israel. So we're, let's look at something related to that. Deborim or Deuteronomy, do the right thing, chapter 22, and we're going to look at verses 13 to 19. And when any man takes a wife, and she'll go into her, and she'll hate her, and she'll make abusive charges against her. What does it mean to go into her? Come on, guys, y'all are smart. Y'all can figure this one out. And hate her. Think of the story in David's family of one of his daughters and one of his sons and the horrible thing that happened there. The young man has lust for his sister, and he sets up a situation where he rapes her, and then he hates her. So we're looking at probably a similar situation here. A lot of guys get a fancy for a woman and think that's the one, or they cannot control their urges. This is another thing. If you cannot self-discipline yourself, you've got a problem. I uh, had a friend one time that was a professional. He was a Golden Gloves champion. Uh, so you would say at least he's semi-professional or professional boxer. If you're going to be a professional fighter, boxer, you've got to learn self-discipline. What does that mean? You've got to take a hit. There's a lot of people that want to dish it out, but they can't take it. They get hit and they just they lose perspective. They go mad. They get angry. They don't fight with discipline and they get whipped. A real professional fighter that's 50 pounds lighter than some big bully will take care of him. The big bully uses anger and his strength and rage, but a fighter knows when to hit, where to hit, and how to hit. It's the same way. Self-discipline in men's critical. If you cannot take correction and self-discipline, you got a problem. So what do we see here? The guy marries the woman. He has intercourse. In the Bible, intercourse constitutes marriage. You didn't have Moses explaining to you how to do a marriage ceremony. Later on in Judaism and in Christianity, you get these ceremonies. What were the ceremonies for? They were to validate the relationship amongst the eyes of the community. Nowadays, we got the state involved, and that's going to be a little bit more of a talk that's probably going to ruffle some feathers. You're making a contract with whatever state you're in. So your marriage is not between you, your wife, and Elohim and the Hebraic community. It's between whatever the state is and you and the wife. Got some serious concerns about that, especially how our government's going. But anyhow, intercourse constitutes a marriage. So many of you, include no wicked dog here, probably has a, several wives out there, because before I came to the truth, I was doing whatever other heathen was doing. So if I had to honor those commitments, don't go down on the Mormons and get mad at them or the Muslims, I'd have about 12 wives too. So guys, if you're out there and you've done that, that's called fornication, not adultery. And we've repented of it, once we understand Torah, and then we can move on. Because that's going to become important about the unpardonable sin stuff. People want to make uh, divorce the unpardonable sin, and we're going to talk more about that. So he hates her. In other words, this guy's a jerk. Maybe he had a little too much wine, and he flatters this young lady, 
and he gets his way with her, and then he doesn't want nothing to do with her. Sorry, buddy. If you're going to be a Torah follower and you have relationships with a lady, she's now your wife. Yeah, I'm good. Have a ceremony. Ceremony doesn't make her your wife biblically. You know what does? Uncomfortable to some people, but that's the facts. So we see this. Now let's go ahead and read more of this story. I took this woman, and when I came into her, I did not find her a maiden. That's his excuse. Then mom and daddy are going to bring out the proof of the maidenhood. Because what's this guy done? He's slandered with evil a maiden in Israel. If he is not telling the truth, there's going to be something to pay. You know, the H-U-W word. I don't want to say it because that's another video about that word. And I didn't find your daughter a maiden. And the elders of the city shall take the man and punish him if they find him a liar. This is why you need judges. This is why you need a bet den in your congregations, on your state levels, your local levels, maybe a national level. Why don't some of your leaders finally call up some of the other leaders and start talking about this? State level, local level, national level bet dens. And don't tell me about some guy that started a bet den and wouldn't have uh, abide by the ruling of the bet den. I know about that guy. Doesn't mean you quit bet dens because somebody abused or manipulated a bet den. Uh, rabbinical court, if you want to call it that, I call it an ecclesiastical court. It deals with stuff in the congregation based on scripture, not psychology or men's opinions. Anyhow, they punish the guy, right? That's because he brought an evil name on a maiden of Israel. What, we, what did we say? And she is to be his wife. He's not allowed to put her away all her days. He can't shalak her. And we see, we're see we going to see another word in a little bit for divorce. He can't divorce her. And you say, well, Frank, what if she's tired of the guy? Here's a scary thing about Torah, and the ladies are going to get upset about this, but many women have been so indoctrinated by atheistic, feministic, humanistic teaching in America and other Western countries that they can do anything you want. You know there's really nothing in Torah. Now, in Second Temple times, in Paul's time, it's different. But originally in Torah, a woman couldn't file for divorce. A man had to. Well, Frank, I don't like that. Well, then you just said you don't like Torah. In fact, one time in a Bible study in 1999, before I had ever got into Hebraic roots and I was studying it, I was studying the Sabbath, I was studying all these things, and I was looking at different groups. I went to an independent home Bible study, so I thought I'd bring something up about the law because I was invited to teach. And I was talking about the importance of the law. Well, after the Bible study, I got a couple of congratulations from people, and I got this one woman who come up to me, and she said, I don't like your teaching. That's why I divorced my husband. He was wanting to follow that law stuff. See, I didn't call it Torah back then. What does that tell you about that woman? She didn't want to be under authority. Not of him, but under Scripture. Don't tell me you love the Messiah and you despise his word. Don't work that way. Now we're going to look at the scriptures that uh, get referenced in Matthew. We're going to start to move out of the Torah to the Natrim Ketavim, or the writing of the apostles. People are going to say, well, why didn't he say Brit Hadashah? Again, another video. Anyhow, Deuteronomy, Devarim, do the right thing. Chapter 24, verse 1 to 5. Let me read it. When a man takes a wife and shall marry her, then it shall be if she finds no favor in his eyes because uh, he has found a matter of uncoveredness in her. Now, this is almost like we talked about a little farther up, but this is maybe something legitimate. It could be that he's found immorality or something wrong. And I know some of you are still chewing on the fact that I said a woman couldn't get divorced if we just go strictly by Torah, and the women are probably out there sharpening the knives and loading the shotguns, getting ready to come for me. But uh, 
don't add to or take away from Scripture. It is what it says or what it doesn't say sometimes. Well, Frank, we have other rules. Yeah, well, we're going to get into some of that a little bit. But when a man takes a wife, Devarim, Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 5. When a man takes a wife and shall marry her, then it shall be if he finds no favor, she finds no favor in his eyes because he is found in matter of uncoveredness or uncleanliness or adultery, some would say, in, in her, and he shall write her a certificate of divorce. Now, this is not shalak, the word here. This is actually divorce. And he will send, put it in her hand, and send her out of the house. Now, this is where Yahushua, the Messiah, gets engaged in a conversation by some Pharisees. That's Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, and of course, Matthew 19. A little bit, uh, two different times, same subject. And if she left his house and went and become another man's wife, well, what happened? If she was really an adulteress, go back to the Torah again, to the law of jealousy. I didn't quote that because I'm trying to adjust these videos to stay in my one-hour time frame. But there's a lot to say about the spirit of jealousy and the water that causes a curse. You can go back and read all that yourself. If you're new to this movement and what I'm saying is totally new to you, I hope you're in an area in a congregation where you'll get some depth in Torah. We urge everybody coming into our congregation, as a side note, to go through one Torah cycle with us. At least, because we not only go through the Torah and the annual portions, we used to do the triannual but to get some people into that, and then we explain it using sometimes the prophets, the Natrim, Ketavim, the writings of the apostles, to get people grounded. Especially if they've come out of Christianity, you're dragging a lot of baggage with you. You're sort of like uh, Jacob Marley's ghost, dragging all the chains around in the Scrooge story. You're dragging around this doctrinal teaching stuff you need to get cut loose from sometimes. But anyhow, what happens? Well, he didn't want to have her put to death. Think about the story of Yosef and his wife, Miriam, or maybe some of you know her, Mary. He's going to put her away. Because what? She's pregnant. He hadn't seen his wife who he's betrothed to. Betrothal in the Hebraic culture Culture is just like marriage. You haven't consummated the act, but hey, it's like you give her the ring, and he hasn't seen her for a while, and he comes, and there's a little bit of a bump. You know what I'm saying? All the ladies do. If you don't know, guys, ask your wife or your fiance or whoever, and he's going to put her away. He's in this predicament that Deuteronomy here is talking about in this chapter. It takes a divine messenger to come to him and say, no, wait a minute, you don't understand what's going on. Marry her. Consummate the relationship once she has the child. They actually have their ketubah. That's more of a modern thing in Judaism and Hebraic roots, modern, relatively speaking, you know, sometime during the te Second Temple period, maybe a little before that, you have the ketubah. But now it's a standard thing. You have a contract. But what happens if she left his house and went and become another man's wife? Let's say he didn't want to get her stoned to death. Let's play out the story of Joseph in this. So he puts her away. He shellocks her. But technically he hadn't divorced her yet, right? And the latter husband shall hate her and write her a certificate of divorce and put it in her hand, and send her out of the house, or when the latter husband dies, who took her to be his wife, then the former husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her back to be his wife after she's been defiled. For this, for that would be an abomination before Yahovah. This is going to become an interesting doctrine later on. If you look at this passage and think about Israel, who Yah divorces. But 